morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the, this international conference on um, Asia's post-pandemic of order and integration, which will examine the outlook of ASEAN and the Indo-Pacific. Um, as the program indicates, this conference will have six sessions over two full days. Um, sessions one to three will take place today, followed by another three sessions, four, five, and six on the second day. Um, but before we start, we would like to remind speakers to keep to the time limit strictly to 10 to 15 minutes as allocated in the program. And please turn your microphones off at all times, except when presenting your paper and responding to questions. Um, we have an impressive lineup of distinguished speakers who will represent governments, government advisors, academics, researchers, foundations, um, advisors to governments and the media from ASEAN, India, and Europe. And in this opening session, the opening remarks will be presented by the heads of our three organizers of this conference, the ASEAN Studies Center of Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, the Research Institute on Contemporary Southeast Asia, the IRASEC, based in Bangkok, and the ASEAN Studies Center, based in New Delhi in India. Um, followed by the representatives of the governments of Thailand, France, and India. So may I now call on Professor Sutipan Chiratirat of the ASEAN Studies Center of Chula Longkorn University to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Swadhi uh, Krab, a very good morning to you all from Bangkok, to wherever you are located in the world. Excellencies, distinguished participants, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I have a great pleasure on behalf of ASEAN Study Center of Chulalongkorn University, one of the joint organizers to welcome you to this international conference. It takes place primarily online, virtual, as a physical presence, uh, in a COVID-19 environment is difficult. Our question even on our own campus. We all know the COVID pandemic took us by storm the past year. It great disruption for the way we live and communicate now more than one year and a half. It reaches the whole humanity is still endure no doubt it has also exposed all facets of life, strengths and weaknesses of different government systems, whether this concern digitalization, social consciousness, inequalities and environment. In addition to other issues, all kinds of struggle we are facing are much more than complex than ever before. For these reasons, the three joy organizers decide to join hands in this timely moment that we should take this opportunity to address a much changing context of our region in relation to the present and future world. We find the theme Asia post pandemic order and integration a very challenging one, despite the fact we are still very much in the mid-pandemic and not yet out uh, post-pandemic, as we said. But the pandemic comes to add more to make these new dynamics and changing landscape beyond one's imagination. That's why we are so fortunate to have our distinguished speakers, our colleagues, uh, who will speak uh, frankly with their own voice, hoping and views on this changing global, regional order and integration, implications and consequences with the rich discussion we will have all along these two days. Another dimension we think we need to focus, that is the role of ASEAN on outlook of ASEAN and Indo-Pacific as crossroads. Two years after ASEAN adopt ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, AOIP, 
at the ASEAN Summit in Thailand in 2019. It would be great if we could debate whether much has happened since ASEAN defends its own version of the no pacific centrality among major partners like Australia, China, the EU like France and Germany, India, Japan, Russia, and the US, just to cite some of the important partners and players in the region. The jury is out there, but for sure, the ASEAN grouping of 10 small to medium-sized economies from Brunei, Cambodia, to Thailand and Vietnam, we put into test about ASEAN centrality and unity in the face of changing geopolitics, geostrategy, and the move of major powers countries that are also have their own version of Indo-Pacific strategies. The big question remains on how we could work together for the benefit of our own people and how we could be inclusive uh, rather than exclusive in our approach, working approach uh, in the future. For us here, the grouping has already so much to take care of new arising regional issue, especially to take care of the COVID-19 pandemic and the hardship as a whole on a wide range spectrum of society. And the Myanmar crisis, since the military coup taken place in February this year, all that cannot, we cannot negate all that kind of responsibilities. All continue to pose challenges for the bloc. Why greater rivalry in particular China and the US is also still on the rise in South China Sea, the Mekong region, the digital disruption and supply chain reorientation. In this context, and despite the fact ASEAN has stemmed out ASEAN own uh, Indo Pacific version, its objectives and principles that include four areas of cooperation, namely maritime cooperation connectivity, sustainable development, and economic collaboration. ASEAN need to prove ASEAN can be different and make this happen rather than just talk only and no action. Question remains whether ASEAN existing integrating role is enough and effective, especially capabilities of existing regional institution and architecture, and even consensual way of ASEAN and non-intervention in neighbor affairs, that some start to put doubt about ASEAN, and we cannot uh, forget our ASEAN citizens uh, uh, that are watching uh, whether ASEAN can live up to their expectation. If that is such a case, uh, we might like to gather what changes are necessary for ASEAN to make ASEAN relevant and fitted into new changing playing fields and in our context, the Indo-Pacific latest development. To conclude this conference also serve as celebration of 20th anniversary of the French Research Institute of Contemporary Southeast Asia, era sex CNRS, and the 10th anniversary of ASEAN Study Center of Chulalongkorn University. The ASEAN India Center, RS, New Delhi, our long-standing partner, join us in this collaboration, which makes this tripartite partnership a valuable one. This is also present uh, as a departure point to build a credible academic think tank network and offer pertinent perspective on the Indo-Pacific. We are grateful to Kun Usana uh, uh, Aparanan, Director General, Department of ASEAN Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Thailand. His Excellency Dr. Thierry Matu, Ambassador of France to Thailand, and His Excellency Dr. Mohan Kumar, Chairman of RAS.
for their sincere support to our conference and to the, for their special remarks in this opening session. We are also pleased over 30 distinguished speakers here and the world over will share their views on why the issue that will shape the future of ASEAN and the Indo-Pacific. Considering time zone difference and busy tasks all they have, their voice expressed here are so precious for us all. We would like to thank them here for each of her or his contribution. Also, the conference could not take place as it is without the real support from our three institutions and our colleagues, our staff who put all the energy behind the scene for these two days even. Uh, finally, we would like also to thank all participants in this Zoom room for the interest and taking time to participate in our conference. Let us wish you all safe and enjoy this special edition of our conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sutipan Chiratiwat. Uh, next, I would like to invite Professor Claire Li Di Lien Tran of Irasek in Bangkok to present her opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, your excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, dear participants, all over the world. Uh, thank you so much for being with us uh, today. And you are numerous, I can see, in, in, the, in the room. So uh, we are really uh, sorry. We, are deep, we deeply regret that we were not able to organize this conference live in Bangkok and give the participants the opportunity to meet uh, and to discuss all together uh, in Rio. Nevertheless, the online format will offer us uh, the chance to largely open the audience in Asia and all over the world. Uh, and uh, you know also that this conference will be recorded and put online. So you, for those who cannot uh, part participate in all the conference, you, can, you, you will be able to hear the different session uh, online. Um, I just wanted to begin um, with the idea of this conference uh, which came up in Bangkok with a desire to organize with uh, my colleague, my dear colleague, Achan Sutipan Shiratiwat, uh, to organize a joint conference to celebrate together uh, our birthday, the 20th anniversary of IRASEC and the 10th anniversary of the ASEAN Study Centers at the University of Chulalongkorn. And we wanted to celebrate our longstanding collaboration on contemporary Southeast Asia issues. Not only me, but also all my uh, other colleagues before me. Um, the issue of the Pacific appears as an important common issue, which could gather uh, the researchers from IRASEC and Chulalongkorn University networks. And uh, I would say also that the importance of the topic for the French ambassador Thierry Matou, himself a researcher specialist of China in their relations and Himalayan studies, um, and um, because also he's the architect of the French in the Pacific policy. That's also a reason why we uh, choose this topic. And um, I would like to add that thanks to Professor uh, Sutipan, uh, I had the privilege to um, know Professor Prabir Day from the ASEAN Studies Center of um, uh, um, uh, the RIS um, Center in New Delhi. And uh, so it's, it was really a great opportunity to enlarge the partnership, not to, to limit uh, to Southeast Asia, but uh, so the, the partnership with India is really very important. And I'm really very happy about this fruitful scientific collaboration between our three research institutes. And uh, I hope that it's only the starting point of the building of a larger academic network um, on these uh, important issues of uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, I would like also to uh, mention here my colleague and friend, Stéphane Dover, historian and the founder of our center, IRASEC, uh, who convinced the French Foreign Affairs 20 years ago about the interest to have a research center, not only in China, India, 
in Japan, but also in uh, uh, Southeast Asia and in Bangkok. So the idea that Southeast Asia was a major crossroads, economic, cultural, and religious, uh, uh, and um, was very important. And um, of, um, Stéphane Dover was convinced by the centrality of uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, if this uh, conference is uh, organized, organized now, it's also thanks to Stéphane. Um, so at the moment, Stéphane Dover is the head of the cooperation academic cooperation in Jakarta. And we are very pleased to welcome him as the chair of the session three. Um, I would like just to thank you um, um, also to uh, um, the director general of the Department of ASEAN Affairs in Thailand, uh, Mrs. Usana Berananda, uh, to uh, the ambassador, the excellencies, um, Thierry Matou, ambassador of France in Thailand and the former director of the Asia Direction at the French MOFA, and uh, His Excellencies, uh, uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar, former ambassador of India in France and chairman of the RIS in New Delhi for accepting to open this conference. Uh, your extensive experience in the diplomatic field and your academic expertise and knowledge are particularly valuable for to us. I would like also to uh, thanks the more than 30 researchers coming from all over the world, uh, but in, from um, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Sing uh, Singapore, not unfortunately, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, China, Europe, India, Japan, and USA. Um, it was not easy to manage uh, such a program with so many time zones, and we uh, um, regret, for example, that we were not able to organize a participation of Australia and Russia uh, as initially planned. Um, and I really am very grateful uh, to um, Professor Amitav Acharya, Professor um, uh, Raoul Mishra and Professor Surat Orachaiku uh, for accepting to be the keynote speaker and offering their global view on the Indo-Pacific issues. I didn't... Uh, uh, talk about Jean-Baptiste Cabestan because unfortunately uh, he will be not able to attend the, the, this, open, this uh, opening session uh, because he's in Africa now and we, we have to move to the session seven. And so thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Cabestan, to be with us, but uh, well, you, you will address your presentation in session seven. And um, so I just would like to conclude in saying that this event could not happen without the significant academic, financial, and logistic support of our three institutions. And I would like to thank you, particularly all the members of the three teams uh, who uh, works a lot for the organization of this event, Kuntitia, Lipli, uh, Kuntun, uh, Bertrand, Jules, and Sarah for, from uh, New Delhi. So uh, thank you so much for uh, being uh, here with us, and thank you so much to all uh, the people who uh, uh, make possible uh, this conference uh, in the, uh, with people from all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Claire. May I now call on Professor Robert. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lipley, for the invitation and giving the floor. Uh, very good morning from Delhi. And uh, uh, this is a uh, beginning of a new uh, new network of think tanks and institutes in Indo-Pacific. Uh, today's conference, International Conference of Asia's Post-Pandemic Order, uh, Integration, Outlook of ASEAN and Indo-Pacific at the Crossroad. It is being organized at a very opportune moment. And I thank you uh, Professor Sutipan, the ASEAN Studies Center, the Chula Longkorn University for taking the lead and also inviting the French organization in Southeast Asia's office of CNRS for an ASEAN Studies Center at RIS to be a co-partners. And uh, I welcome uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar, our chairman in, in, in this session, in this um, conference. His Excellency uh, Dr. Thierry Mathieu, the Ambassador uh, of France in, in Thailand, and uh, Ms. Usana uh, Barananda, the Director General Department uh, of ASEAN Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Thailand, 
in the inaugural sessions. Uh, today's inaugural session will give us a direction for the entire two days. We have picked up seven important sessions uh, in, in this, uh, confer at this conference. And the seven sessions talks about, seven sessions is going to talk about geopolitics, economics, security aspects, and many other dimensions it's being unfolded in Indo-Pacific regions. We found there's a huge interest in this conference. Over 500 people actually registered, and I'm sure they will be keep coming and going and attending session. We have kept the session a bit academic because academic dimensions are very much required to be added. Indo-Pacific means it's just not like security. Indo-Pacific also means many other things. That's what the leaders like Ambassador Kumar, Ambassador Thierry Mathieu, and Madam Usanna Barananda, they are looking for it. So this, we are going to discuss the seven sessions, 30 important scholars across the world. They will be presenting their papers and those papers are well written in advance. So, so to me, this is just the beginning and, uh, and uh, the France from European Union is a leading proponent for the Indo-Pacific. India is a natural partner for Indo-Pacific. And, and Thailand, which is the pivot for ASEAN centrality, the representing the ASEAN centrality in the Pacific. This is an excellent choice. And we look forward to uh, the proceedings, the discussion, the deliberations in the two days. From my side, I'm very grateful to uh, Ambassador Kumar for agreeing to come in, despite his busy schedule, it's early morning in Delhi, and others, uh, all Indian and ASEAN and the participants who have joined today. Uh, conversation and in inaugural sessions. Finally, uh, I thank uh, ASEAN Study Center, Sri Lankan Universities, all their colleagues. Mm -hmm. They put up their hard work uh, day and night. And in fact, in the yesterday, to the early morning, even I seen there are WhatsApp and other mail messages coming up from there. And still, the registration is going on. So that in says indication that it's interest. People are picking up. Uh, you know, it's interest in this program. I also like to invite. Uh, ambassador Sucharita Durai, Indian ambassador in, in Bangkok. She has registered. I hope she will she has joined or she will be joining or somebody from uh, Indian mission in, in Bangkok. High commissioner in Brunei, Indian high commissioner in Brunei, high commissioner Singh. He has also registered. I'm sure that he will be joining and many others which I could not see them. Probably they will be coming in different particular sessions. Finally, thank you uh, and a big uh, congratulations to ASEAN Study Center for their 10 year celebrations and, and Professor Clara and her team for taking up this initiative and also to congratulate uh, your organization for commemorating this 10th year. Thank you very much and very good morning. Thank you. You have to unmute. I forgot to unmute. Um, Professor Prabir will also launch two books um, by the ASEAN Study Center in Chula Longkorn University and the RIS, as well as another book um, authored by Professor Arabinda Acharya. Uh, Professor Pr Prabir Day. No books? I can't hear you. Oh, I see. So after the keynote addresses, we will come back to the release of the books, please. Okay. Um, yeah, we, so do do that. Yeah, we do that after the, 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 the keynote speech, yeah. Okay. Um, can we now call on the representatives of the government of Thailand, France, and India to present their opening remarks? Um, first, we have Her Excellency, Ms. Usana Berananda, the Director General of the Department of ASEAN Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. Ambassador Thierry Mathu, Dr. Mahan Kumar, President of the RIS, distinguished academics, colleagues, and friends. A very good morning to you all from Bangkok. 
it is my great pleasure to be part of this conference. Let me begin by expressing my appreciation to the ASEAN Study Center, the ASEAN India Center, and the Research Institute for Contemporary Southeast Asia for co-organizing this timely event as we look to shape a better future for in the Indo-Pacific region in the post-COVID-19 era. It has been more than a year since COVID-19 emerged to change the course of global public health, as well as the dynamics of the global strategic equation. The Indo-Pacific region is no exception. The twin impacts of COVID-19 and major powers rivalry have affected regional geopolitical and geoeconomic landscapes. This underlies the need for a robust multilateral framework and further strengthening of ASEAN centrality. Amidst the current challenges, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, or AOIP, can serve as a guide for ASEAN to engage with all partners based on mutual trust, mutual respect, and mutual benefit. Colleagues and friends, uncertainties, disruptions, and rising tensions in the region may make us question whether the AOIP is relevant and can help generate the positive momentum in this region. The relevance of the AOIP lies in the promotion of an open and inclusive regional architecture. We must redouble efforts in building strategic trust and promote win-win cooperation in the four areas identified under the AOIP. And to sustain the relevance of the AOIP, we need to think ahead. What will our region look like in five to 10 years? To this end, allow me to highlight three areas that will play a key role in shaping the future of the Indo-Pacific region and should be prioritized under the AOIP. First is health security. The pandemic has taught us about the serious repercussions of health crisis. Our priority at the moment may be on vaccine multilateralism and pandemic response. But in the wrong run, we should look to advance innovation for the health and well-being of our peoples. This could be concretized through existing mechanisms in us in health sector, as well as initiatives from outside, such as the ASEAN US Health Futures, public health cooperation initiative with China, and possible cooperation on traditional medicine with India. Second is digitalization. Digital economy can bring about one trillion US dollars boost to ASEAN's GDP by 2025. Yet, the regions need to do more on upgrading its digital infrastructure and enhancing digital integration. In this regard, we look forward to connecting the connectivity with our external partners and welcome collaboration on development of digital infrastructure as well as promotion of digital trade connectivity. Third is climate change. ASEAN's target to reduce energy intensity by 30% and increase the component of renewable energy mix by 23% by 2025 are just in four year time. Capacity building and technology transfer from our partners could therefore assist us in implementing climate measures. At the same time, our green partnership could also generate opportunities through investment in climate-friendly industries, such as renewable energy, smart cities, and smart mobility. This will complement with Green Deal strategies adopted by our external partners, including the EU, the RK, and the US. Colleagues and friends, in moving forward win-win cooperation, ASEAN welcomes constructive engagement from our external partners in these three areas. We are open to explore practical cooperation with our partners in the areas where our mutual interests converge. We hope that the Indo-Pacific strategies 
including India's IPOI and French strategy in the Indo-Pacific for an inclusive Indo-Pacific. We work well with the AOIP to promote durable peace, prosperity, and sustainability in the region. We look forward to fruitful exchanges and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, Usana Berananda of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. May I now call on His Excellency, Dr. Thierry Matu, the Ambassador of France in Thailand, and um, the former director of the Asia Direction at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Well, thank you very much. Uh, dear DJ Usana, dear Ambassador Kumar, distinguished guests, academics, fellow diplomats, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. Sawarikap, namaste. I would like first to congratulate all the organizers of this uh, conference. Uh, the uh, Hazen Study Center from Chulalongkorn uh, University here in Bangkok, Irasek also in Bangkok, and of course, uh, as an Indian center uh, in India, it's a pleasure to see Thailand and uh, India uh, on board uh, on this important occasion. So as a brief introduction, if you allow me, I would like to say a few words about the French Indo-Pacific strategy, because as it was said, uh, I happened to be the one who wrote the draft of this strategy two years ago when I was DG for Asia and the Pacific at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in Paris. And because I chose to come here to Bangkok uh, in Thailand, because I am convinced and France is convinced that Southeast Asia has a major role to play in our uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, but obviously the centrality of ASEAN is key and uh, I'm sure you will have opportunity to uh, uh, I mean, discuss this. So first of all, let me tell you very briefly uh, the, the four reasons, actually, why France has decided in uh, 2018 to coin its own Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, basically, actually, there are four reasons. Uh, first, uh, I like to recall that France is an Indo-Pacific nation where more than one point uh, five millions of our fellow citizens live from overseas communities and where we maintain a significant military presence. So we are not neighbors. I insist on that. We are part of the Indo-Pacific uh, I mean, region. And as a matter of fact, 75 years ago, France was um, among the founding uh, I mean, members of UN ESCAP, which headquarters is here in Bangkok. And I think the time has come for France to be, let's say, more active and more visible in this region. Second, the Indo-Pacific uh, has become, obviously, the new global strategy center of gravity, experiencing several tensions because of the growing number of geopolitical, security, environmental, and trade challenges in this region our president has decided to strengthen our partnership in the region, which is clearly now on the top of our priorities in the world. In that context, we feel the need to defend the principle of freedom, openness and inclusiveness, and a method, multilateral cooperation, in a context based on the rule of law and democratic principles. So to summarize, we want to contribute to the solving of regional issues. Third, this region is having to act urgently to address global challenges such as climate change, it was mentioned, biodiversity erosion, and of course, the pandemic crisis. So we are determined to take action along with our Indo-Pacific partners through concrete projects, and I, see, I insist on that, concrete projects, which help build the resilience of our economies and health systems, reduce the risk of natural disasters, and diversify our value chain. So for us, Indo-Pacific is not ideology. It's clearly a pragmatic vision to face urgent challenges. Fourth, we want to offer, let's say, an alternative to bipolarity. Uh, our vision of the Indo-Pacific is focused 
on an objective of stability and development. Alongside our European partners, and I will say a few words about the EU strategy, we are considering the regional situation without being exclusive. And we have been insisting since the beginning on the need of an inclusive approach. But at the same time, we are not naive. Beyond any logic of blocks, we intend to champion a surpass in the Indo-Pacific to respond to today's upheavals with all well-intentioned stakeholders. So based on these considerations, our strategy for an inclusive Indo-Pacific region centers around four pillars, which were uh, presented by our president in Sydney in May 2018. First, we would like to be more involved in the uh, resolution of regional crises, and also it's an example in the securing on the main shipping routes. Uh, I, will know, I will not go into I mean, details, but just to give an example of a regional crisis, we, for instance, fully support as an initiative to try to find a solution to the situation in Myanmar and are eager to contribute very concretely as a member of the P5 and of the EU. Second, we want to strengthen the tie that bind the countries of a region on the basis of converging vision and shared interest, notably with India, uh, which has been a key partner for us in the Indo-Pacific for a long time, but also with Australia, Japan, New Zealand, South Korea, and ASEAN. ASEAN, which is clearly key in the implementation of our strategy. And also, because I insisted on the fact that our strategy is uh, inclusive while deepening our relationship with China in the strategic framework that is now that of the European Union. So it is in that context that we are considering upgrading our relation with Thailand to the level of a strategic partnership because it's essential for us to have a close interaction with all the major stakeholders in the region, especially in Southeast Asia, which is at the center of the Indo-Pacific region. Third, we want to intensify our mobilization in regional organizations, starting with ASEAN, which aims to remain at the earth of the construction of multipolar Asia, and of which we are now a development partner. As a matter of fact, I also initiated one year ago the partnership between France and ASEAN, which is key in our strategy. Uh, I, want, I also want to insist on the fact that our Indo-Pacific strategy, as a matter of fact, is very close to the uh, AOIP presented in November uh, 2019 here in Bangkok by ASEAN. We also want to intensify our relation with other uh, organization in the region, such as the Indian Ocean Rim Association, the Indian Ocean Community, the Pacific Community, and the Pacific Island Forum. Fourth, we want to take action to promote global common goods, including the climate, the environment, biodiversity, but also obviously health, education, digital economy, and quality infrastructure by building our efforts on a stronger engagement of the European Union. Our projects also focus on maritime safety, the environment, governments of oceans, protection of the marine I mean, resources, academic cooperation and research, and scale up connectivity. Our Pacific strategy is fundamentally a project-based strategy. I insisted on, on, on that uh, aspect, it's concrete, I already said it. In that context, uh, all our networks are involved, namely our diplomatic, I mean network, obviously, but also our agencies, higher education institution, research institutes like IRASEC, but also the private sector. Last but not least, I would like to insist on the fact that the EU, 
uh, itself is preparing its own Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, last April, uh, the EU Council invited the Commission and the High Representative to present a joint communication on the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific by September 2021. So very soon, we'll have an EU Indo-Pacific strategy. France was the first EU member to coin its own strategy, obviously played a key role in this evolution. And in the view of a French presidency of the Council of European Union in the first half of 2022, this will give us an opportunity to highlight the important role the EU has to play in the region. So I would like to say as a conclusion that you can count on France to keep the momentum as far as we are concerned in the Indo-Pacific region. And we will also be keen to take on board all new ideas to always be more efficient and concrete. As a matter of fact, when I wrote the draft of our strategy, I was inspired by many contributions from the academic sector. And in that respect, the contribution of the academic world, your contribution will be very precious. So I wish you the best for this conference and once again, I congratulate all the uh, organizations uh, who participate because I think this conference is very opportune. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, Dr. Thierry Matu, the ambassador of Tha uh, France in Thailand. May I now call on His Excellency, Dr. Mohan Kumar, the former ambassador of India in France and the chairman of the RIS in New Delhi to present his opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be participating in this important conference. I want to start uh, with full disclosure that I do not necessarily speak for the government of India. As you rightly said, I'm a former Indian ambassador. I now chair a think tank. So I suppose that gives me more liberty to be more frank than some of my other colleagues who actually are still wearing hats in the government. So I just wanted to be clear about that. I also want to congratulate all the three organizers for this conference. I've gone through the topics and they are remarkably frank and they cover the entire scope of the subjects within this important theater called Indo-Pacific. So I do want to congratulate uh, uh, the three uh, think tanks for doing this. I want to make a request that if this can be recorded and the conclusions then brought out that would be extremely useful. So if we can do that, because I see that you've got almost an impressive list of speakers and so on. So I'd be very keen for someone to do that. So I appeal to my colleague, Prabir De, and if you can coordinate that with our friends from Thailand, that would be very useful. Uh, the French ambassador uh, spoke eloquently, I thought, and he has made my job remarkably simple because uh, I tend to broadly agree with the French uh, um, view on this um, Indo-Pacific theater. He talked about the center of gravity shifting to the Indo-Pacific. I couldn't agree more. I completely agree. And therefore, to me, the three existential questions facing the Indo-Pacific in the post-pandemic era are as follows. The first question is, how soon can we get out of this COVID-19? And if that means vaccinating most people in the area, that is Indo-Pacific, then what is the challenge? So that is the first question. I'm, I'm saying this because the future of Indo-Pacific and the ability of the Indo-Pacific to go back to pre-pandemic levels of economic growth is not just important for the people of Indo-Pacific, but also because that makes an important contribution to global economic recovery. Bear in mind that 60% of the people, at least 50% of GDP tends to, uh, to originate here. And the contribution to global economic growth comes from the Indo-Pacific region. So the first question is, what can we do to get out of the COVID? There is a double jeopardy because if you don't vaccinate everybody, and then we have seen variants come in, and then you have to do lockdowns. 
and that hurts economic growth. So that is the first question for me. The second question is really about the climate change, which was alluded to by the French ambassador in Bangkok. I think the Glasgow conference is important for the Indo-Pacific region. And we must try and see if we can get our act together. India obviously is an important player, not just because the greenhouse gas emissions are involved, because the per capita emissions are very low. And there is the issue of climate finance that is affordable finance, but also access to technology. So the climate change issue for me is extremely critical. The third one I would say is maritime peace and security. And there I would like to underline two things. One, again, which the French ambassador said, which is the freedom of navigation, extremely important because most trade goes through this region. The sea lanes of communication are so important for global trade. So we need to have freedom of navigation at all times, especially in the post pandemic recovery phase. The second is, can we try and get a broad consensus on status quo when it comes to disputes? After all, ASEAN is negotiating a code of conduct with China. And I think it's important while negotiations are going on and while we are trying to talk to each other, can we at least agree we will not change the status quo unilaterally? This is extremely important for the maintenance of peace and security in the Indo-Pacific area. I don't want to take too much time because there are an excellent list of speakers who will then speak in the first session, but I will now push my non-governmental status a little bit more and try to provoke you. First, ASEAN faces a strategic dilemma. We know that, and this has to do uh, with the fact that you've got US and China, you've got trade friction. I understand you don't want to choose sides. Now that is very clear to an outsider like me, but what if you were pushed to? That is something a think tank like this should be able to do because you are speaking among academics, you are speaking among people who can speak candidly, who can consider issues and objectivity. So the first is the nature and extent of the strategic dilemma faced by ASEAN. This is not of just academic interest to countries like India, because we have been repeating the mantra of ASEAN centrality. This is almost a part of every single document that we say on Indo-Pacific, that ASEAN centrality has become absolutely, as I said, like a mantra. So we need to understand, I need to understand, people need to understand the nature and extent of the strategic dilemma faced by ASEAN. That would be wonderful if some people can try and talk about that. There is an opportunity to do that in one of the segments of the conference I've seen where it frankly discusses these things. But it'd be nice if one can hear a frank discussion on that. The second thing which I would urge my friends in ASEAN to do is to elaborate and articulate red lines. I need to understand, a lot of people outside ASEAN need to understand the red lines of ASEAN. And you know what I'm talking about, right? Whether it is disputes, whether it is maritime security, territorial integrity, vaccine injustice, what are the red lines for ASEAN collectively? so that the outside world can understand where ASEAN is coming from in this particular area. I cannot imagine the construction of an architecture in Indo-Pacific without ASEAN, without the full participation of ASEAN, without the full engagement of ASEAN. But that needs to be done only, and that can only be done if we have a better understanding of the strategic dilemma of ASEAN and the red lines of ASEAN. So I'll stop here. Great privilege and honor to be participating here in the inaugural conference. And thank you very much to the organizers for doing this. Uh, I don't think a conference like this is more timely, frankly. The kind of um, fluidity that we are having in the international landscape, where so many things are going on, new administration in the US, European Union, the Council, the European Council came up 
with conclusions on Indo-Pacific. France was, of course, much more avant-garde. By the way, France is the only resident power in the Indo-Pacific as well. So we need to understand that. But I think EU is also trying to get its act together. Before all of that happens, I think it would be good if ASEAN really elaborates some of these points for those of us who are trying to look at this region. And, and I dare say that the future of international relations to many to a great level may well be decided by this theater of Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to reading the conclusions of this conference. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Your Excellency, Dr. Mohan Kumar, the former ambassador of India in France and the chairman of RIS in New Delhi for your provocative questions and invitations to discuss the centrality of ASEAN. It's a, it's a big question in ASEAN and uh, a couple of the sessions, uh, session three particularly, will be discussing this very issue and I hope you can participate. Um, now I would like to call on Professor Prabir Day to announce the launch of uh, a number of books. Professor Day. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Lipley. This is just an announcement. I'm not releasing the book. Is. So this is one book uh, which is written by uh, Professor Arabinda Acharya. Uh, Professor Acharya is with the Ramadan uh, Academy in Abu Dhabi, uh, and his co-author is Antara Desai. So this, is, this book is uh, South China Sea Developments and its implications for freedom of navigation, very much the subject we are discussing and came out to, to the morning from Ambassador Kumar's presentations. And it's, the book is published by World Scientific in, in Singapore. So congratulations, uh, Professor Acharya uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Desai for, for you know, getting this, presenting us this book in this occasion. Thank you very much.